The first thing to do is find support for the hypothesis and uh, stuff that goes against the hypothesis in the source. Basically, look for quotes. This is where you want your highlighter out. Support for the hypothesis in this source that the idea that the spots of Robert Kurthals were William Rufus's greatest threat. Uh, the quote, the most powerful Frenchman, kind of stands out to me because that suggests that they were a big threat. Also, that Bishop Odo was involved, because we know he was quite a powerful magnate. And then it says, this land was very stirred up and filled with great treachery. All of those three quotes I will be putting in my support for the hypothesis. On the other side, things which seem to go against the idea that it was the supporters of Robert Kurthose that William Rufus's greatest threat. We've got, all England acted according to his plan, and just as he wanted. So if all England is doing what William Rufus wants against the rebels, then maybe it wasn't such a big threat because everyone was on his side, apart from the rebels, of course. And then the other one says, Earl Roger was also in that foolish plan. So it's suggesting that the rebels' plan was a foolish plan, i.e. not that great, and therefore not that big of a threat. You also need to bring into this some own knowledge. So what do we know uh, about the source here that, that seems true? Um, which also supports the hypothesis. Well, we know that Odo was the leader of the rebellion and a very influential man because we know from our own knowledge he was the half-brother of William the Conqueror and therefore William Rufus's half-uncle. He'd also acted as regent when William the Conqueror was out of the country. So he was quite a powerful man. Although, on the other hand, we think what's missing from the source doesn't actually mention that Bishop Odo led the rebellion. Um, so there's another thing that you bring into it. Uh, we also know that six of the ten most powerful men, according to the Doomsday Book, were involved in the 1088 Rebellion, which kind of confirms this the most powerful Frenchman little bit. Um, what else have we got over there? Well, um, things missing from the source other than what I've just said is we know that Rufus went straight for Bishop Odo at Pevensey and defeated him before then doing so again at Rochester. And then the rebellion crumbled after that. And it doesn't really mention uh, all of this. It... it so it kind of plays down how, oh, I don't know, straightforwardly William Rufus managed to deal with the whole rebellion. So we've looked at our knowledge, we've looked at quotes. What's missing? Well, if you paid attention to the bit about the mark scheme, you'd know provenance is a bit that's missing. Mi missing. And a little phrase that you'd use, you can see it in my little PowerPoint slide at the end of this, is, of course, you have to be careful when using this evidence because, and then I'd put, it suggests that William gained lots of support because he, quote, did so well by the bishop, which is overstating the role of religion. And, and this is a typical thing that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle would do because it's written by monks. They would often overstate the role of religion. William Rufus probably didn't defeat the rebellion just because he was doing so well by the bishop, whoever that bishop happens to be. It's probably because of his decisive action in laying siege quite quickly, which we'd know from our own knowledge. However, when we look at the other side, we think, yeah, but there is some reason to suggest that the source might be reliable, because it is written by a monk at a time before Lanfranc died. So there was not yet a poor relationship between Rufus and the church. In fact, it's quite favourable to Rufus, because it says great treachery, and the king did so well by the bishop. Um, so later sources written by monks might be a little bit less favourable towards William. Of course, you always got to check the source. Uh, but this one is... It's quite favourable towards it. And you can see all of the things I've just said on the source uh, on the source PowerPoint, which you can pause after listening to this. Hope that was useful. We've got to look at the flip side now because we're going to look at some other rebellions because that's what, or some other threats should I say, because that is what the um, source B, C and D is all about, different threats. So in this case you've got to, if, it's, if it suggests that this other threat is a huge threat, then that goes against the hypothesis, but if it suggests that this, these other threats are not so big, then it suggests that the supports of Robert Curtis might be a bigger threat. So support for the hypothesis for source B, which is of course all about the 1095 rebellion. Well, we've got quotes here. It says, immediately captured all the Earl's leading barons. William Rufus immediately managed to capture them all. 1095 can't be so serious. Also says, took the Ty castle of Tynemouth. Um, and that suggests that he managed to take a castle. Not, not so 
uh, so serious if he did that. Also says, unsuccessfully attempted to defend himself, but was wounded and captured. Uh, referring to Robert of Mowbray, of course. So he quite easily managed to take Robert of Mowbray. Those are quotes I would pick out which suggest that this rebellion isn't so serious. But on the other hand, I saw some quotes that suggest that this rebellion might have been more serious. Uh, than, and therefore a more serious step than the sports of Robert Curthose. So we've got, since it appeared impregnable to attack, he built another castle in front of it. So therefore it's, it's fairly a fairly serious event if he's had to build a whole castle to defeat it because he couldn't take uh, the castle of Bambra. It says stronghold called Newcastle, castle of Timemouth, Bambra. Three castles which had to be attacked in 1095. And we know from our own knowledge that William Rufus only had to attack two castles in 1088. So those are the quotes that I've been putting in there. I've already mentioned a bit of my own knowledge. And this is the thing. You don't do this separately. It all should come together. You should be mentioning own knowledge in with the quotes, with the provenance, as and where it's relevant. Um, but we've got some more knowledge that supports the idea that 1095 might not have been serious. Uh, we know that Rufus did capture castles and that Robert of Mowbray was caught. And everything in the source seems to fit what we know from our own knowledge of events. Um, and, and again, that matches when, with the against bit because we know that Malvesin, or bad neighbour, had to be built in order to end the revolt. Provenance, though. Here we go. Of course, you have to be careful when using this evidence because it is written in the 1120s and 1130s, which is a long time after the event. It's very likely that Huntingdon was relying on accounts told to him by others or from other written sources and there's no way of knowing just how reliable those sources that Huntington was using were. There is, however, reason to suggest that the source might be reliable because it's written by an ecclesiastical contemporary historian. I'll say that again. Ecclesiastical contemporary historian. Which means somebody who was a historian around at the time who was also religious or working in a religious capacity. And they are often harsh about Rufus. Uh, those people, ecclesiastical people, as we know. But this source is fairly balanced, even criticising Robert of Mowbray for being puffed up with pride. So there we go, those are the things I'd say about source B. So source E, this is all about uh, Wales and Scotland. It says at the top that it's um, all of an account of Malcolm King of the Scottish came to pay homage to William Rufus in the provenance bit. But actually it does mention uh, quite a bit about Wales and you'd see that if you read it. So support for the hypothesis, i.e. that Malcolm and Wales wasn't such a big deal. What is here? Discovered a mode of counteracting their designs. So that suggests that William Rufus found a way of stopping the Welsh. Um, and also it says, the basis of peace was laid between Malcolm and William. It's not a great massive threat then if, if it's mentioning peace. Um, on the other hand, it suggests, oh, it says, he performed nothing worthy of his greatness. I.e. William Rufus found it very difficult to, to deal with Wales. And the unevenness of the country and the badness of the weather assisted their rebellion. So he's, he's struggling and there are reasons why, but perhaps the most damning evidence that suggests that this was a bigger threat is that it says lost many of his soldiers. He doesn't seem to have done so well in Wales. What knowledge have we got that confirms these things? Well, we know that Rufus secured peace with Malcolm in 1091, and when he raided again he was killed, that's Malcolm, was killed in 1093. William did have castles built near the Welsh border, and we know that Welsh raiding of England was not an issue during the reign of William Rufus. So that might suggest that it's not such a big a th threat because it was happening in Wales rather than England. That's a bit of our knowledge which would suggest that 1088 was a bigger threat. However, against the hypothesis, we've got the fact that William Rufus performed badly in Wales. And this was largely because of the Welsh guerrilla warfare tactics, which kind of suggest that links perhaps to this unevenness of the country and the badness of the weather assisted the rebellion because the Welsh found it easier to get away. But there are bits of knowledge missing from the source, so it means you can question it. it fails to mention that Malcolm and Rufus were not at peace for very long, which we know is true. As I've said, Malcolm was killed in 1093. Um, so yeah, that also links to that. It doesn't really mention Malcolm raided into England again after Rufus didn't keep his promises and ended up being killed by Robert of Mowbray. 
which can be seen in Source B if you have a look. Cross-referencing, by the way, is an excellent skill to show. It's an A, A star sort of thing you'd, you'd see in a great student's answers. Because it says in Source B uh, that Robert of Mowbray was puffed up with pride, having laid low the king of the Scots. So you could, if you'd spotted that, that would make the examiner go, oh, great, we've seen a bit of cross-referencing. There's a provenance point to mention here. Um, it is, oh, I should say my little phrase, there is reason to suggest that the source might be reliable, because it's written by an ecclesiastical contemporary historian, and they are often harsh about Rufus, but this source is fairly balanced, even saying positive things, such as when it suggests the chance of war was generally on his side, i.e. Rufus was pretty good at war. So that's source C. Hope you've got something similar. The last source is all about the threat posed to William Rufus by Anselm. So evidence that suggests that Anselm wasn't such a big threat. First of all, you always do this, look for the quotes, look for the evidence. Add the own knowledge and the provenance afterwards. Start with the quotes, the evidence in the source. The first one is, successfully subdued and settled Normandy. So there's evidence that Normandy wasn't such a big threat. And also, he soon received their surrender. On the other hand, it says uh, evidence that suggests Anselm was a bigger threat. Quote, greatly displeased with the soldiers sent because not suitably trained nor fit for warfare. This suggests that Anselm's undermining William Rufus, playing a tricky game. He's sending soldiers, yeah, just like his, his, his duty would demand, but he's sending poor soldiers. Um, and also says that he was summoned, Anselm, uh, to the king's court. So the king must have thought Anselm was a big threat if he's summoning him to the king's court. Own knowledge. We should have a fair bit of our knowledge about Anselm and William Rufus. Um, so, in support of the hypothesis, well, we know that William Rufus and Anselm quarrelled often. Um, but, you know, never actually caused a huge deal of trouble. There was no fighting involved, nobody ever ro raised an army. It was mostly quarrelling. On the other hand, all knowledge missing from the source, which goes against the hypothesis, Anselm consistently disagreed with Rufus. You might suggest it's a big threat. Tried to reform the church in England, which William Rufus didn't really want, and called the Council of Rockingham in 1095 to try to force Rufus to allow him to leave. Well, Anselm was a huge threat to Rufus's reign, really, um, certainly from the religious side of things, and possibly the biggest. But the source doesn't suggest this. So when you're looking back to the question here, how far do the sources suggest that 1088 is a, is a big threat? The source, this source, doesn't really suggest Anselm was a big threat, which is a reason to question the source. When you're doing your conclusion, you can't really conclude that Anselm was a bigger threat because the sources don't give that evidence. What do we mention about the provenance? Well, of course you have to be careful when using this evidence because... It suggests that the Welsh surrendered, which they didn't. And it also, um, as about, about the threat of Anselm, it downplays the threat of Anselm and blames Rufus because it's written by Anselm's friend, Edme. It says, all such hope and expectations were shattered by a letter in which the king... There's another interesting point. You must always back up what you say about provenance with a quote. Now, there are the sources spoken through. We'll think about a conclusion. 